because uh, I was never a long-distance runner. Uh, they, they, the coaches would try to talk me into it from time to time. And, 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 you know, sometimes you get yourself in situations. Anybody ever got yourself in a situation? I mean, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about a good situation. I'm talking, you get yourself in a situation, why am I, what am I doing? Why did I get into this? Why did I say yes to this? How did I get here? Anybody relate to that? It's real, isn't it? Well, one time we went to the track meet, and I was a shot put thrower and a discus thrower, and, and the coach came to me and he said, Lundgren. I said, yeah, coach, what? And he goes, there's nobody hardly at all signed up in the two-mile run. And there was like eight schools there. And he says, we need you to run that race, Lundgren. And all you have to do is finish because there's only like three or four guys. And they gave points to five places. If you, if you place five, you get one point. And he goes, if, if you'll just go run and finish the race, you'll get an extra point for our team. Well, little did he know is that all the other coaches were doing the same thing. Only the guys they were putting in the two-mile race could actually run. And, and I was like a snail compared to the runners. So we got out there. It was, this is in western Oklahoma now, and it was in September, and it gets just as hot there in September as it does here. And I couldn't believe all those skinny guys out there in getting ready to run. And there was like 15 of us by the time it was time to run. And they shot that gun, and, oh, man, I swallowed my Adam's apple, the uh, and, and I got cotton mouth, and they took off. And those guys took off like they were running the 100-yard dash for me. And they left me behind in no time. I mean, it was pathetic. I came around all by myself. I was all, they were already halfway around the next corner when I came by, and all my, guy, all my buddies were laughing at me and <laughs> pointing at me. I'm going, oh, this is not good. And it was hot. And, and so I'd run 440 yards. That's back when everything was in yards and not meters. And, and so I kept running. I said, oh, i got to finish for coach. i got to finish for, uh, you know. And I got sick. I started getting sick. Stomach cramps. And I wanted to, I don't know, the regurgitate. That's what it was. I wanted to regurgitate. And I, I couldn't. And I was just, oh, and my legs turned to rubber bands. You ever had your legs turned to rubber bands and they're just weak and wobbly and I couldn't hardly do it? And I came around the second time and I saw my buddies there and I ran right up into the stands. And I sat down. There's eight laps and I'd only done two. And I, and I was already dead. And, uh, and so we get in these situations, right? And, and, and lo and behold, the coach kept coming to me on stuff. One day there was the high jump. And those guys are pretty skinny too, you know. And there's the high jump. Hey, Lundgren, there's nobody in the high jump. This is a different track meet. And I go, coach, come on, man. The last time you did that, I, I, I embarrassed myself. Oh, no, no, it's different this time. You got to do it. Okay, I'll do it. I ran up and tried to jump that thing, and I hit my knee on the bar, you know. And I said, come on, coach. Well, the next track meet, there's nobody in the 120 high hurdles. 120 yards high hurdles. These hurdles are about that high. I'm not kidding. And he talked me into it again. You know, when your coach is your best friend, and that's who Jesus is, right? He's our coach. And, and sometimes he talks us into stuff, and we get in the middle of it, and we say, uh, was that really Jesus? Did he really get me into this? Is that really, you know, and, and so I said, okay, coach, I'll do it. And again, he said, there's only five guys. All you got to do is beat one guy. I go, coach, I've never jumped over a hurdle. I said, how do I do that? He said, just run and jump. I said, okay. <sighs> I got up, and these guys were jackrabbits, man. I mean, these guys were like greyhound race dogs. And, and we're down there, and I'm shaking. We get down in the starting blocks, and I'm all sh quivering and shaking. And those guys are just cool as cucumbers, you know. And, and the gun goes off, and, man, I, it scared me, I guess, because I shot out of there like a cannon blast, cannonball. And I, and I beat everybody to the first hurdle. I mean, I, I could see peripheral. I could see, that, man, why aren't these guys up here? And I, and I went to try to jump it, and my foot hit, hit the hurdle. Boom, hit it. Bang! And it went down. Bang! And it was real loud. It crashed real loud on the, on the uh, it was like a, a, a soft asphalt kind of a thing. And it went, 
bang, and it was so loud it scared all the guys next to me. I was in the middle, and it shook them up, and, and they it threw them off their pace and off their timing, and, and I, there's like, I think there's like 10 hurdles, maybe, maybe nine because 120 yards, and they give you a little space. I knocked down seven of the nine hurdles. I mean, they went straight down, and I just kept running. I hit, my foot hit every one of them. You know, you're supposed to go over with your foot. And, and I hit, and, and this is a true story, man. And I hit it, bang, and I'd keep running, bang, and I'd keep running. And these guys are getting more scared every time they hear the bang, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm just about that far ahead of them. <laughs> and, I, and I won my heat. There was four heats. Four different groups had to run. I won the heat, and the guy next to me, the little jackrabbit, this guy could run like the wind. He is coach protested. Oh, that's illegal. He's got to be disqualified. He can't be in the finals. The coach and the referee looked at the, nope, he's, that's fine. He says, as long as it stays in his lane, it doesn't matter how many of those things he knocks over. As, as long as it goes down and stays in his lane, it's all legal. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> we got to the finals. You know, don't give up no matter how, how awkward or how much of a failure you may look like in your own eyes. Don't ever give up. So I, we get to the finals. Here's the jackrabbit next to me again. And you know how they warm up? They just, before the referee gets there, and they, they warm up and they bust out of there and they jump a couple of hurdles, you know. And they look like, they look like deer. They look like deer jumping over. These guys are so smooth and they're so good. And they were all doing that. I didn't even do that. I wasn't going to warm up because I might hurt myself, you know. So, so I wait, and here comes the starter again. And, and I'm down just shaking up. It's a sick feeling. It's a sick feeling. Kind of like, kind of like when you go up and you, you ask somebody, have you ever heard about Jesus? That can be a real sick feeling sometimes because, you know, our flesh is so weak, and the enemy is so real. He'll come at you, try to devour you. And so anyway, I'm down there, and they shot the gun, and I don't know, man, the adrenaline must have been peaked out in me that day because I beat them all to the first hurdle. And this is the finals. And I thought, I, I probably won't knock any over this time. <laughs> sure enough, man, boom, crash. And everybody's, ah, you know, and, and but the little jackrabbit, he, he mustered a little bit of strength from somewhere because he nosed me out and he beat me and I got the silver medal and he got the gold. But hey, I'll take silver any day, you know. And so I was happy. And that's right. And, and I, I still have the silver medals. And I remember I, I, when our boys were little, how, how cool is life? Isn't life amazing? Our boys were little and I, and I actually won two silver medals and a bronze in the high hurdles because I kept doing it and I... I knock down fewer and fewer each time I do it, but uh, I showed them those medals, and I don't know, it wasn't that many years ago, but it was when they were probably 16 or 18, I think they said, Dad, was that the Olympics? Are they, the, was that the Olympics? Did you win that silver medal? Did you win an Olympic medal? And I go, uh, no, and I don't think I ever told you that, you know, but you never know, dads can stretch his stories quite a bit, but I, no, I never told them it was the Olympics, but anyway. God is so good to us, isn't he? And uh, honestly, I can tell you, I never, you know, those guys, will, you'll crash. Those guys will crash. And if it's a cinder track, it, the, the little gravel gets up in your skin. I mean, it all rubs you raw and you're bleeding and there's gravel in your wound and you have to be, you know, what they call it, debreeding. You have to do that. They have to wash it all out. I never once fell. And, and I've seen guys with their faces just scabbed over from crashing on these high hurdles. I never once had that happen to me, so he, you know, the Lord was good to me. So no matter what it looks like, and no matter how hard it is, or how impossible it looks, even if you've never done it before, you've got to, you've got to get in this race for Jesus. Not only for Jesus, we've got to get in this race for the, all the people around us who are watching, who need him just as much as we do. Seriously, folks, they need to see something that they've never seen before in this world. 
They need to see the mighty works and the beautiful, amazing grace, love in our lives that Jesus Christ alone can give, and it's real. The Apostle Paul said it this way in one place in Philippians, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Man, that is huge. Pressing on. I'm not going to give up because Jesus is my strength. Amen? I'm not going to give up because Jesus is my wisdom. I'm not going to give up because he is my courage. He is my righteousness. He is my all in all. Amen? So the Apostle Paul had that in his soul. He said, and you know, the past can haunt you. And the devil likes to use the past to drag us down and to, and to detour us or to delay us. He'll hit you with everything in, the, in your past that you've got. You can do a lot of things about your past. The, you can look at the human race and see what they're doing about their past, their, their, their mistakes, their failures, their struggles. And they'll go drink themselves silly to where they hopefully can't remember their past. And then they can't even remember the last three days after they drink that much. And then, and then, or people will go and they'll lie about their past to try to make it different. They'll, they'll change history. They'll lie about their past to try to make people think more highly of them because they, they don't think people care about them. And that's a lie. That's a lie too. Now, there may be some people who don't care about you and me, but all of God's real people care about you. And sometimes it may not even look like your brothers and sisters in Christ care about you, but I guarantee you they do. And when a push comes to a shove, they're going to be there for you because they got Jesus inside of them, and he's going to hold them up just like he held up Peter. When Peter wanted to run, Jesus held him up. And he can hold Peter up. He can hold you and me up because Peter's one of the biggest cowards in the history of the world, and he proved it. And I'm one of the biggest cowards in the history of the world. And the only way I can keep going is to lean on Jesus. And if Peter hadn't have discovered that, if he hadn't have discovered that the only way he can run the race and finish the race was to lean on Jesus, if he hadn't have discovered that, he might have been right there with Judas, hanging himself. And I guarantee you that's not the way to go. Jesus is worthy. So he said, I press on. I stretch forward for the prize. And the prize is in Colossians 1. It says that the mystery of God of ages, of all the ages, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's huge. That's incredible that I get to be like Jesus. I actually get to be like Jesus Christ. I get to be loving. I get to be kind. I get to be intelligent and honorable. I get, to get, I get to come to the place where I will no longer hurt anyone. That is wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? That we can actually hang on, to, clean, hang around, hang out with Jesus enough to where we get to the place where we don't hurt other people. Man, that is a relief to know that that is our prize. And on the way there, we get to do it less and less and less, and we get to apologize quit more quickly. I think it's really awesome to be able to realize right away that you hurt somebody, and then you right away start working on how am I going to... How am I going to fix this, Jesus? How, how are we going to fix this? Or help me fix this, Jesus? Man, if you don't know how to pray that prayer, that's what prayer you better be getting into. And I think it's so awesome to get to the place where you can do it much more quickly than you used to. And say, I, you know, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I thought I had victory over that. I thought I 
had gotten to the place where I would never say that to you ever again, or I thought I would never do that again, but man, here it is, six months later, pops up out of nowhere, and I landed on my face again, and I'm so sorry. Will you please, please forgive me, and then do something to show that you really mean it, like go to the store and buy a bouquet of flowers or or, uh, I don't know, buy them a new car or something. I don't know. <laughs> now, I don't have to hold up to that because I don't have the bank account for it. But if you do, you're on the hook. But, uh, <laughs> or take them to Hawaii, you know. Now, some of you guys need to be taking notes right now because you're going to go out of here and you're going to forget this and you're going to blow it again and say, what was that he said I should do if I did that again? Yeah, you should take her to Hawaii. That's what. Or your kids, you know. Amen. I got one amen out of a brave woman here. Or your kids, you know. I mean, we need to do special stuff for our kids when we mess up, don't we? More than just say, I'm sorry, and, you know, dad or mom, we, we mess up too. We need to do something special to help them know, hey, that, man, he, he let go of $50 for that, man. Wow, he must have really been serious about being sorry. You know, the serious, don't you guys know? Don't you guys know that stuff's real? If you don't, you need to read a good book or something because there's plenty of them out there. Forgetting what is behind. There's only one way I know to get away from my past, and that is to do what what, uh, Paul says here. I look forward to what lies ahead. I press to reach the prize of God. And I also do this. I keep looking to Jesus. I keep my eyes on Jesus. And then I see my past. The devil's going to bring your past up. He's going to try to condemn you. He's going to try to make you feel guilty, make you feel like there's no way you can go to heaven. Look at all the stuff you've done. And you know what? They're not going to forgive you again. You've done this 500 times. There's no way they're going to forgive you again. He will do that. But I guarantee you, you look to Jesus. And that disappears in the fog over there somewhere because he will finish what he started and it says in 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 hebrews 12 looking unto jesus the author he started it he'll finish it of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of god and the joy that he had for the joy that was set before him is you You are his joy. The joy that was set before him was to give you a savior, was to do everything he could to rescue you, to help you to escape the powers of darkness and the curse of sin. That was his joy that day because he knew that if he didn't do it, we would be left hopeless. And that's who Jesus is. In 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul says this, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations that he had, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. There's a lot of theories and ideas about what that was for Paul. But the fact is, he asked God to remove it, and God said no. You need this for your faith experience, for your faith journey. You need to suffer this because without it, you'll jump the tracks. And you'll do the same thing Lucifer did. It'll go to your head and you'll think you're all that. So every time you suffer as a Christian, you need to understand God is saving you by His grace. Now, I know people don't like that, and a lot of people don't agree with it. That's why I put this verse in here. That's why God put it in, because I got it from him. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's enough to stop and sing the hallelujah chorus right there. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 
And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Uh Uh-oh, he's gone crazy now. That can't be true. You're going to rejoice in glory for trouble, for problems? Yeah, I didn't read the rest of it in 2 Corinthians 12. He actually says, I rejoice in my afflictions. Paul learned this secret, that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. Without that promise, this world will be so upside down, so confusing, and God will be confusing because all this crazy stuff can't be real, and if God was so real, why is this happening to me? And you've got to lock in with childlike faith and say, I rejoice in my troubles and in my afflictions and tribulations because my God is in charge of everything that comes to me. And he loves me so much and he is so smart and he's so powerful that he will never kick over one high hurdle. He will make everything work for my good. That's real. He never made one mistake in his whole life. This guy that was running next to me, the little jackrabbit, he was, a, he was in our rival. It was a rivalry. Man, after football games, we'd have fights. I mean, we'd literally meet after the game out in the parking lot and fight. That's what they do in Oklahoma and Texas. You know, at least I hope they don't do it that much anymore. But we used to, we sure used to. He was from Texoma, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, and Oklahoma. It was on the border. And, and I hated this guy. And I was so happy that I scared him that day. And that's not right. I wasn't a Christian. I didn't have what it takes to treat people right. And, man, if I could smash him in a football game, it was like a success, even if they won the game. I mean, that's how twisted the football mind can be. You guys have been hearing about that, right? You guys have been hearing about some of that? Well, it's pretty real. So, hey, I had a guy on my own team didn't like me, and he tried to put me in the hospital during a football game one time. I said, man, we're on the same team. What are you doing? He said, I don't like you. I said, wow, you know, what do you do? And it's kind of hard to be thankful for that. But that's who Paul was. He was, he rejoiced in his troubles. People hated him worse than they ever hated me. They beat him with rods. They stoned him. They chained him to a dungeon, a dingy, stinky, vermin-infested dungeon. They hated this guy. They finally killed him. And I can't wait to get to heaven. I want to ask Paul, what song were you singing when when they dropped the you-know-what? Or what prayer were you praying? Was it the same prayer that Stephen prayed while you were killing him? Were you praying the same prayer that Stephen was praying? I got a funny feeling that's probably the one he was praying. But I want to I want to I want to I want to have my interview with the apostle Paul, Elijah. Of course everybody wants to have an interview with Queen Esther. She probably the second most beautiful woman in the history of the world. I mean the king of Persia doesn't go around picking junk, you know. And Eve is probably the one that's prettier than her. And then I'd have to say my wife is third place. So sorry ever, you know. You know. You know. That's not bad for billions of people, right? So third place is good, sweetie. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation, that tribulation produces endurance, perseverance, willpower. It produces never die, never give up, never say quit. In Christ, that's what it produces. Outside of Christ, it produces depression, anxiety, suicide, it produces all the ugly stuff that's in. But in Christ, it produces endurance, never say die. And perseverance produces character. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about good character. And character, hope. And it goes on to say, and hope never disappoints. The hope of Christ never disappoints. So this is very real, the, the, the moving forward in faith. We've got to trust that even when a world is crashing down upon us, God is using it not only for his glory, but for our ability to give him more glory and for his ability to be able to use us to help the people around us more than we are right now. Because every time we go through a trial and a struggle 
it's refiner's fire. And he fine-tunes us. He may add a few components. Who knows what all he's doing, but he's the mighty creator of the universe. He can be trusted. You can thank him in the midst of any trouble you have to deal with. And as you do that, the enemy has no leverage on you. When he comes to harass you about something ridiculous you did, say, yeah, well, that guy's dead. I buried him yesterday at the foot of the cross. I buried him along with everything else that I buried there. And you, don't, you can't dig it up. You can't dig it up because there's no shovel sharp enough or strong enough to penetrate the blood of Jesus Christ. And everything I've ever messed up or done wrong is covered by his blood, his life, his victory. It's real. We're in the days of Elijah and all those other people out of the Bible, but you fill in the blank. Hopefully you have the childlike faith enough to put your name right there because that's where God wants it and that's where it can be. You are prime real estate and there's a big war waging over you, but Jesus has paid the highest price. The auction is over. All that remains Will you go home with Jesus or will you go home with his enemy? And if you say neither one, that's his enemy. That's one of his little traps. We're going to sing a song as we close. We're all going to sing it together. And it's a beautiful song. I hope that this is a song that you're allowing Jesus to make real in your life. So I invite you to stand as we sing this song. And as we, as we sing this song, ask yourself, am I, am I living under the blessing and the benefit of everything Jesus did for me that day? Am I really cashing in on everything that he's wanting and trying to give me. And if you're not, all you have to do is say, Jesus, help me. Just like the thief on the cross. That's basically what he said. He said, Jesus, help me. And we're, we're in just as big a problem as he was in that day, that thief on the cross. And just, just say yes to Jesus. The only thing you'll ever regret is that you didn't do it sooner. It's worth it. Let's sing. Burdens are lifted. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is there. Just the ladies, just the ladies. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and pain. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is there. Amen. Everyone join, everyone. Burdens are lifted. Just the men. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heart. 
sing it one more time and if you'd like to come up here so that we can pray afterwards whatever it doesn't matter what you need to pray about may, if it's the first time you're coming to Jesus that's awesome we may do some dancing up here if that's the case because all the angels in heaven they'll be dancing because all of heaven rejoices and I have a feeling that they rejoice kind of like David did when he rejoiced King David so if you've never given your life to Jesus, this is really a great time to do it. And God will do something and he'll send you out of here with more power than you've ever imagined. Or if you just need to pray about something else, or you want someone to pray with, there's, there's folks out there you can pray with, or you can come up here and pray with some of us. But God is here because he said he would be, and you need to get everything you need before you leave here today because it's a lot scarier out here, out there than it is in here. This is our headquarters. This is where we team up, power up, and move up. As we sing this chorus one more time, please, if, you, if the Holy Spirit is drawing you and giving you the courage and suggesting, yeah, you need to do this today, come on down and sing. Burdens are lifted. The chorus. Burdens are lifted. Amen. Well, let's pray to close. And, and after I say a short prayer, if you have the ability or you'd like to stay and pray, feel free to do that. The Lord is with us. Let's pray. Abba, Father, thank you so much, first of all, for sending Jesus to become our big brother, our Savior, our healer, our sin sacrifice, our mighty God. And then thank you, Lord, for creating us in his image. Go with us now. Go before us. Watch behind us. Be all around us at all times. And teach us how to be in tune and in harmony with you and we will give you the glory forever because only you can do these things in Jesus name we pray hallelujah to his name forever and ever and the church says amen amen God bless you as you go amen and if you want to